welcome everyone. Nice to have you here today. Let me share a couple of announcements with you and then we will share yours with us. Office is closed tomorrow. Uh, that is a major holiday so we won't be in. Please don't get sick or we'll go to the hospital. We'll figure all that out. Sign up sheets back there. David, are you ready for that one? I'm always ready. You're always ready.
with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts to God. Give thanks to God, our Maker. For it is holy and right to do so. Okay, the hymn today is number 92, For the Beauty of the Earth, verses 1, 4, and 6, and it's also on the uh, monitors. Yes, I know that uh, 
down in Texas, there's a, uh, a family I know that is not doing so well, and the, uh, the, the man's wife has uh, pulmonary fibrosis. Please pray for them. Yeah, um, yeah my name is Carolyn, and his name is Todd, and their last name is Stangrona. S T A N G R O N E. S T A N G. S T A N G R O N E. Stand right. Yes. Okay. Other joys concerns? Most of you know this is Memorial Day, and usually at this time uh, we take an opportunity to. Memorialize the friends and members and constituents of this church that have gone on to their final reward since Memorial Day of last year until Memorial Day of this year. These are the names I'd like to read to you. Uh, have you enter these families' names on your prayer list as well? They are in alphabetical order. Alberta Bickerstaff, Norris Crathwall, Fred Morrow, Rose Prophet. Dixie Rensberger and Karen Stein. Would you join me with me in a moment of prayer?
page number 402, we will sing the first verse. Lord, I'd like to be a Christian.
the back page of your bulletin, you'll find our scripture lesson. If you would stand with me, please. It's also on the big screen. For those of you who are new with us, we read scripture out loud together. We would invite and welcome your voice to read along with us from the 14th chapter of John, verses 15 through 21. Read with me, please, as we find this to be the inspired word of God. If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you. I told you before that one of my favorite authors is a guy by the name of Charles Schultz, and years ago he came up with this little uh, Peanuts comic strip. I found this one. It's a little hard to see. You know, let me try to explain. I know you can't read what Linus says there at the bottom, but this is Linus Van Pelt. Linus is uh, kind of the uh, conscience for Charlie Brown, and he does things and says things, but when Linus gets upset, when Linus has a stressful day, Anybody go about a stressful day? Of course we do. We know exactly what that feels like. I don't know what you do to offset stress, but I know what Linus does. He builds sandcastles. He says to Charlie Brown in another comic strip that that's the way he works off his stress. He wants to work with his hands. And this is what he does. Now, you look at that, that in the top frame up there. That is a pretty elaborate sandcastle. So he's got some stuff he's trying to work off, isn't he? But the rains come. And you can see in the subsequent film clips. And down at the very bottom, Linus says this. I know I'm supposed to learn some kind of a lesson here somehow. But for the life of me, I can't figure it out. You've been there. You've been there. You think you're doing something right? You think you're doing what God has called you to do? And suddenly you run into all kinds of opposition? That's what a does. He builds in. From professional baseball, about a hundred years ago, 
James, I'm not this is not working. Here we go. Walter Johnson, anybody remember him? Walter Johnson was a great pitcher in his time. Played for the Cleveland Indians between 1907 and 1927 when he retired. He was at his prime when he, they thought that he could throw the baseball more than 100 miles an hour. Now, that's pretty fast even to today's standards. The story is told that the rookie who stood in to face the great Walter Johnson stood up and Johnson threw two quick strikes. In fact, the rookie said he didn't even see them. They were so fast. And he put his bat on his shoulder and he turned around and walked to the dugout. And the umpire said, hey, come back here. The rookie said, you can keep that third strike. I've seen all I need to see. <laughs> You've been there too, haven't you? Things that go nicely on Monday and Tuesday and then by Friday, uh oh you get a little messed up. You keep that third strike. I've seen enough. Jesus tells his disciples that he must go away. Now this was a program that he and God made up whatever day one was. Jesus was going to be here for roughly 30, 32, 33 years. That he was going away. Now the disciples are a little concerned because they had started this grand movement of Christianity. And now their leader was going away. And he said so. He said, I have to go. But in this passage, he tells us exactly how that's going to be carried on. He gives them a link to, from the past to the present to the future by saying, I will not leave you comfortless. I will send to you another. And unless my Greek is way off, the word translated for comfortless is a word which in the American language we get the word desolate. Ever been desolate? Ever felt like you were desolated? Sure you have. You've been there. You felt that. You knew what it was like to feel comfortless and desolate from time to time. All we have to do is look at the newspapers and find, you know, there's a war in every country. Our economy is still very sluggish and has not caught up. High school graduates, college graduates, post Graduate work sometimes are still having difficult times finding work. This weather cannot warm up fast enough for me. Sickness, illnesses, deaths. Add all that together and sometimes we feel like, what's going on here? Why am I feeling this way about life? Some of you from the who have lived through the 1970s. Okay, there we go. Jim Croce, if I remember him. He sang about desolation once upon a time. I won't ask you to sing it with me, but I do remember this. You don't tug on Superman's cape. You don't spit into the wind. You don't pull the mask off that old Lone Ranger, and you don't mess around with Jim.
turn our world upside down. It's that same spirit that manifested itself on Pentecost Sunday, who is still available to us. I guess our question is, do we take the time to notice that as a resource in our life and use that resource to get over the comfortlessness and the desolation of our life? It's a matter of receiving the gift. Which brings us to today's passage. Where do we go when we need to find comfort and get away from the desolation of life? I think there are three themes in here. I, I wouldn't be a good Methodist minister if I didn't say there were three ways to look at this. I want to share them with you this morning. If I can get this thing to advance. Thank you. First thing is love. Jesus tells the disciples, if you love me, you will keep my commandments and I will pray to the Father and he will send to you another comforter. I think I can make a pretty good case for you that there's not a lot of love in this world anymore. Would you agree? All you need to do is read the paper and watch the 6 o'clock and 11 o'clock news. Perhaps you heard the story of a lady who had very, very late in life and she confessed that she, for many, many years that she had been rather bitter and resentful and sarcastic about life. She had made mention and spread the rumor that her friends or her neighbors weren't very nice, but actually she was envying them because they had this great family and they had children. She herself felt like she was doomed to a life of maidenhood. Isolation, loneliness. She said she had stopped praying and was blaming God for the hand that she was dealt in life. But then one day, quite suddenly, love came into her life. A rather young widower asked her to marry him, and after that moment, she radiated a brand new personality of her life. She was a different person. She was filled with love and laughter. And she said that she regretted those years of despondency and bitterness. And she said, if I had only known earlier how my life was going to turn out. Now, I'm not telling you that romantic love is the answer to your comfort. This lady could have given and received love long before she met her future husband. There were her neighbors. She has an extended family somewhere. Uh, her church, her neighbors, and even God could have been a part of that. When people get into this mode of thinking as she was prior to her marriage, there is one thing certain, that very few people will crawl out of this valley of despondency by themselves. We all want, we all need to share and receive love. One of my favorite Hollywood actors is a man by the name of Don DeLuise. He has gone on to his reward, but he was a clinically depressed person. And he knew how he needed to deal with his depression in a more positive manner. He said this, and I quote, People who are feeling down do not take advice. The nature of the illness is that they will not take advice. To pull yourself out of the valley of depression, I would tell them this. Go and find someone who is in trouble. Go to the hospitals. Go to the convalescent homes. Find somebody in need and do something for them. And try to put a smile on your face. After he said that, Don Melloui seemed to go into a moment of personal theology when he said, what happens is this, and God will say, because you care about somebody else, I'll give you a better feeling. And that feeling is genuine. The feeling does not come from eating candy bars or snorting cocaine or does not come from liquor. It comes from helping another individual. End quote. That's good advice. Some wise, wise sage once wrote, there are ten ways to overcome the blues. The first step is to help somebody else. The second step is repeat step one. The third step is repeat step one. 
and so on. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments, and I will give to you the comfort. And what commandments are he, is he talking about? We're talking about the Big Ten commandments. But Jesus said, also I give you another commandment. He wrote it down in John, the fourth chapter, and he said this. He said, you are to love your God with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Hear the parable? The second theme is this, is that it is truth. Jesus said, I will give you another comforter to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth. The truth flies in the face of today's operational procedure. Because we have white lies, half-truths, deception. You know, the world a lot of times will think of us Christians as persons who do not face the facts. We live in some idealistic unrealistic world, some mystical world, but the world is wrong. The world has been wrong for 2,000 years when it tells us that. The real question is the same question that Pilate asked Jesus right before he crucified him. He said, what is truth? Is truth defined by only what we see, we hear, we feel, and we taste? Or is the world larger than that, our senses? To the people of faith, truth is quite evident in the created universe. And to think otherwise or to believe otherwise would be to deny the facts that you have already experienced in your life. Could an extraordinary world like ours have happened without a divine hand directing it? Could blind protoplasm evolve its way into intelligent, dr dreaming, loving human beings. When we are feeling without comfort and in our moments of desolation, we need to open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts to the evidences that God has placed all around us. We need to contemplate His love and His power His greatness and His promises to us. Final thing is this presence. <clears throat> you know Him, for He dwells in you and will be with you. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father, you are in me, and I in you. That means Christ is here by the power of the Holy Spirit. God, Christ is all these things. The presence of the Holy Spirit is with us in all ways. Jesus is trying to tell us as disciples that the only way that he could be truly with them forever is if he went away. Doesn't make any sense, does it? Jesus said, I can be with all of you, but I have to go away to do it. He did go away, and he became universal for all of us. How does that happen? Let me try to explain it this way. Suppose that Jesus did not go away. Suppose he was still alive and living in Jerusalem right now. Word would have spread about his ability, his miracles, the things that he does, the magnificence that he creates. That word would have gone out like rings Going a rock out of the water, those rings just go out and you can touch it. Every vehicle, every boat, every plane, every train, every caravan, and if you couldn't get that way, everybody who was walking would walk to Jerusalem. They'd want to see him, they'd want to be near him. They'd want to get his attention. Like Jeff was using the, the parable last week of the four friends who couldn't get near the house, into the house where Jesus was because of the crowd that was out around him. So they went down through the roof and lowered their friend down in front of him. 
As far as the eye can see, we can see nothing but billions, and what, there's seven point billion people on the face of this earth, and we all try to get to Jerusalem at the same time? You would never see Jesus. It would be impossible for you to get there. Billions of people. Why? Because we would be crowded out. So you see, Jesus solved this problem before he ever went away. It was necessary that he should go away, ascend into heaven, and that the Holy Spirit of God would come and make God known to us in our, in our hearts and in our minds, our thinking and perceiving. The Holy Spirit has become our conscience. Not only your conscience, but is, is a part of your conscience. Love, truth, and presence. All three come to us by the power of the Holy Spirit in our world today. They are the abiding elements. They are the primary keys to avoiding a life of comfortlessness and desolation. After all, Jesus did promise us this. I will send to you the ultimate counselor, the ultimate comforter, and the eternal witness to the Almighty God. Christ could not remain with us in person. He sent the Holy Spirit into the world, into our hearts, into our families, into our churches, into our minds, into our souls to bear witness to God's eternal love and forgiveness for us. Under such circumstances, how could we feel ourselves comfortless? I will not leave you alone. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. How? By the power of the Holy Spirit. Love, truth, and presence. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit of God. Would you bow your heads with me for a moment?
and said, it's time for us to go home. Gracious Lord, we continue to thank you for being with us by the power of the Holy Spirit. You have given to us this wonderful sense of being in your possession and being a part of your life. And you have asked us to do these wonderful things. And gave it to us an example whereby we may find Jesus the Christ, motivated by the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We are, we are blessed. We give you thanks as we pray this in Jesus' name. And all these people said, Amen. God is good.